this. Got it. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for, for joining. Uh, what is the fifth installment of our systems thinking uh, research made simple? So today we'll be talking about action reaction and the uh, relationships, which are maybe one of the most complex and um, interesting of the DSRP family. Um, I'm Matt Chazzy. I'm a host here at Systems Thinking Daily. I think I know most of you at this point. And I'm joined by uh, Derek and Laura Cabrera, research faculty at Cornell University and uh, leaders of the uh, Cabrera Research Lab. The lab's vision is 7 billion systems thinkers. And the Systems Thinking Daily, and I think this research series particularly, is really important um, part of that vision to empower practitioners like all of us to use the most current uh, research-based tools to uh, engage more effectively with the systems around us. So uh, pretty exciting to have this series in general, have the opportunity to talk informally with uh, Laura and Derek and to dig into these various uh, research questions. So for today, um, we're gonna present, uh, Derek and Laura are gonna present the uh, paper relationships, organize information in mind and nature. And then we will spend some time digging into questions and sort of exploring the ramifications of the research and the relevance to our own systems thinking. Um, you can drop all of your questions, uh, and I hope there's a lot of them, into the chat, and I'll do my best to um, work them into the conversation. And we're going to uh, complete the formal part of the, the session uh, at about 45 minutes, but we'll stay till the end of the hour and uh, continue for those of you who are able to stay. So I'll just uh, make a, a break at, um, what time is it for you? I guess uh, 1.15 on the East Coast. And uh, for those who wanna stay and continue, that's great. We'll be here. And if you need to take off for other things, uh, that's wonderful as well. Um, this session is, as you just saw, is being recorded and we've created in Systems Thinking Daily a micro course that has all of the research uh, discussions in it. And so in about a week or so, we'll post the recording from today, uh, link to the paper, and you can also go back and find the previous uh, four sessions there as well. And, um, and you can also subscribe to the micro course uh, for free, obviously, and you can get these uh, notified when these are posted. So make it a little bit easier to, to find and follow up on. Um, so with that, let's... Uh, hand it over to Derek and Laura and uh, hear about relationships. Awesome. Yeah, that, like you said, Matt, this is the R, as we call it affectionately, R of DSRP is, uh, is um, very much, it's very complex. Uh, it's very dynamical and the research kind of bears that out. Um, R does a lot of really, I mean, I, I love all of D and R and S and P, but R does some really remarkable things. And uh, careful, don't have a favorite. Yeah, I don't have a favorite. Uh, have a favorite. But um, as you might know, uh, R is made up of action, reaction. Those are the elements of R, theoretically speaking. And um, that that basic thing, an action reaction relationship lies at the root of a variety of concepts uh, such as bonds, networks, mathematical operators, correlation, causation, um, and of course is basal, if not uh, totally synonymous with things like connections, integration, affiliations, links, alliances, you know, all, the, all those different sort of words that are very synonymous with R. Um, so R is pretty important. And of course, universal. And uh, I agree. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot more to it than it seems. So it's like all of the other ones. It's like a mystery, a box that is. we keep unpacking. And the research really unpacks some of what's cool about R. So I'm excited to get into it today. But just to give you kind of a quick overview from sort of the most basic, like Newton's third law in physics is essentially action reaction relationships. You know, if you if you put two people on skates and one pushes against the other, they actually push against each other and they'll both move backwards, right? That's an action reaction happening simultaneously. Um, 
along the lines of system dynamics, uh, which introduced us to was was pretty. Uh, I mean, they didn't invent uh, feedback loops, but uh, certainly they popularized uh, feedback loops to the general public. Um, but feedback is an action reaction relationship. So the whole concept of feedback and and all the places that feedback exists really fundamental to that is action reaction relationships that's what feedback fundamentally is and then if you sort of take that up a, a notch into the social domain so you know we're talking about physics we're talking about just general scientific feedback happening in lots of different areas but if we take that into the social domain we get interpersonal action reaction uh in our communication in our interactions um and of course, we also have intra inside ourselves, intrapersonal action reaction relationships. And we'll talk probably a little bit about our quad, which is what that little diagram of those little people are. Probably one of the most important things for psychology, coaching, communicational, personal development, listening, all those kinds of social kinds of things that keep us interacting together. Um, pretty important there. And then, of course, if we go up another level of scale and look at how the R, not at the action reaction part, but just the R, how it manifests, then, of course, we get RDS, right? Above, above the action reaction relationship going scaling up, we get relationship distinction systems or RDSs. And I, I think most folks uh, that are familiar with uh, DSRP theory understand the power of RDSs. So our this this tiny little thing called action reaction relationships, or sometimes I I say RAR relationship action reaction, uh, is is at the base of so many different things that uh, understanding it in a deep way can be very powerful and very practical and very practical, which is also yes. important. So the, the research that we did here in this paper in particular follows very much like the other uh, papers that we've written in this area, but we basically asked the same question about do these action-reaction relationships e exist in nature, right? And does awareness of that R rule actually increase your effectiveness in system thinking or comp you know cognitive complexity, flexibility, all of those things? And so we had a series of studies that uh, answer the same types of questions we're thinking about, which is how and why these types of relationships form. What are the internal and external dynamics around action-reaction relationships? The role that these types of relationships play in both individual and social cognition, and we're going to talk about that in particular with a couple of the studies. Um, how important are just the R rule is to basic metacognition? The effects of that metacognitive awareness. Um, on your ability to really see the intricacies and the dynamics of relationships, which leads to cognitive flexibility, co um, complexity. So we did, I think, seven studies, maybe six, six or seven studies on R that we're going to talk a little bit about. Seven, yeah. I think it was seven. Um, and basically, you know, what we see is that those uh, that they're co-implying, they're interchangeable. They're all linked, as you all know already, since I recognize all your faces, I know you all know that. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about- And those might sound kind of like esoteric in, in a sense, but, um, or maybe they don't, I don't know. But, to, uh, you know, to me, when I when I saw the results of this research that actually empirically proved the sort of what the theory uh, projected, then th th that was that was kind of a big- I think big so. uh -huh. yeah. I also think because relationship is sort of a commonly used word, we yes. think of it very differently than what we think of in terms of the dynamics of what's underneath the concept of action and reaction. So and also the hardest to study, yes. for sure, because it's yes. so dynamical. I remember, I remember most of the relationships in the universe are hidden. Yes. But incredibly influential. That is important. These are the things that we know. So this is the basic structure of any relationship, really. Um, it, we call it a quadratic structure because it has quad four things in it. Uh, it's got uh, the action of the whatever object is on the left, let's say. Let's call that A. And the reaction of, of B. And then the action of B 
and the reaction of A. So there's always these four, uh, this, this quad structure to any relationship in the universe. And, um, and I'm not going to read through all the bullets on the right, but that has some huge implications on, uh, on relationships in general. And also that what this research really gets at is those sub bullets there, which is um, not only does RAR exist in mind and nature, and not only knowing it makes you more effective, that's what the research says fundamentally, um, but also that DS and P, distinctions, systems, and perspectives are required for R's to exist. And in the inverse, RAR, relationships, action, reaction is required to make distinctions, to make part whole systems and to take perspectives. That's really important as well. Um, and then there's all the interchangeability stuff that allows for uh, structural predictions. So what this research is doing is sort of like all these claims that DSRP theory is making, uh, it's essentially putting an empirical grounding to those claims, um, which is kind of, cool frankly i think it's cool it's hella cool yeah these are cool things there you go Raise the roof, scott. <laughs> scott's got it well so you know just to sort of um hang it back into some of the research that uh about all four when we think about r you know these are the the sort of four fundamental things that we teach people at the beginning level of what r is you know these things you all probably know but you know that action and reaction are part of it that um, we need to distinguish our relationships to actually have a better understanding of systems themselves. Um, and also that whole idea of zooming in and out of relationships uh, to see not only the relationship, but also the parts of the relationship. And this is going back to this yes. quadrant on the right, which is the efficacy. Yeah. So we're just measuring, does awareness of the R make people effective? And and this particular set of studies, three three out of the seven studies focused on that. Right, and if you see also um, what we saw also as we did in um, D, S, and P is that that when people are aware of the R rule, those four tenets that I just sort of overviewed, that they do actually see more, there's more cognitive complexity as indicated by their textual responses to the question when they saw the fish tank, um, and that and that really it's a skill that we can purposefully build on and that that helps us understand systems more robustly and it increases the complexity by which we um, we see more. We see so all more. of that is all of that is just simply saying in, in very clear <laughs> statistical terms that if you understand and are aware of RAR relationships, action, reaction, you will think more cognitively complexly, you'll be more emotionally intelligent, you'll be a better problem solver, you'll be a better systems thinker. That's that what these studies show um, fundamentally. Well, and that it's a skill that you can actually build. Yeah, that you can learn it. Is the sort of the crux of it for us. By the way, it's, it's actually, there's a, there's a whole group of folks out there in the systems thinking world that believe that you can't actually learn systems thinking. Like people either have it or don't. And so this flies in the face of that research. It's obviously, uh, it's not research, it's just opinion. Um, <laughs> it flies in the face of that that opinion, mm -hmm. and um, which I think is great because it, it's, it means that it's kind of uh, egalitarian and, and um, accessible, accessible impact, and impactful. impactful and all those kinds of things. Which is really why we're here. Exactly. Mostly. As part of this, just as a side thing, there's seven studies we're going to hit on, but as a side thing, there's also a growing lit review of all the different sciences. This is just a, a graph of the, of the different sciences that different studies, empirical studies of relationships are coming from. Again, just to over time show the immense sort of uh, influence of relationships across the disciplines. Yep. Um, and in another study, you know, if you remember the the study that had almost 35,000 people in the sample, what we realized, if you remember, was 48% of people basically get stuck when they're asked to think something through. But of the 52% of people who actually did try to think things through, 
What we do know is that they do tend to relate things, 46% of them relate things, but what they don't do is also then further distinguish those relationships. Only 25% of people do that. So that's something we pay attention to in particular when we're trying to increase that skill is not only is it about seeing the relationships, but being more careful to go deeper and articulate uh, the relationships into their parts. And so we know what people tend to do and tend not to do, right? And with relationships, um, you know, not only, so we know that they only occasionally relate things, first of all. We know that when they do relate things, they very rarely distinguish those relationships and look at them into, look at them, uh, their constituent parts. We also know that people fall into the trapping of cause and effect relationships, linear relationships. We need to move more towards webs of causality when we think about relationships. So this has huge imp implications for teaching and learning uh, systems thinking, right? Because this 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 graph, which is all based on data, um, is showing us like what people can do more of to get better at it, and it's also showing us what they tend to do less of, right? And so people tend to do distinctions, DIs a lot, then they do R, then they do part whole, and most people don't do R, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then even worse, they don't do P. Um, also, notice that one of our shortcomings in S is also highly related to R, meaning yeah. that we are also very good at breaking things down into parts. So that's a strength in systems, but we we often fail to relate the parts. So there's sort of that little seg segue between them in terms of strengths and weaknesses. And as a very practical thing that you can use. One of the things we say all the time is if you can just convert your lists, list jig, right? List is a part whole thing. And then there's part party jig, which is the relationships of the parts. If you can just make people go from lists to part parties, then you're gonna you're gonna exponentially increase their systems thinking, right? In that very small thing, lists to part parties. And and this is where that statement comes from. It comes from this data. Yep. Right. And our students will tell you if you take it a step further and add a couple of RDSs inside that part party, yeah, then you, that's it. Then you RDS the you part party and you're pretty much there. And then you do a P circle. And that's that it. is in in itself a sort of systems thinking at its most basic. How right. To get an A in you, class. You make a bunch of <laughs> distinctions, make a list, part whole list, part party the list, RDS the part party. P circle the whole thing. You got that's it. that's about all you need to do to be a systems thinker well, fundamentally. We're done. That's it. All right. We'll see you later. <laughs> that's all you need to know. <laughs> um, the other thing that's interesting about R that I just was thinking about is uh, looking at our STMI scores. What's interesting is we're actually, in terms of competence among the four skills, it's actually the one that on the whole people are more competent in. Now, it still comes with the caveat that people are also still highly overconfident in their level of competence, but it's interesting to me to note that it is the skill, you know, that has the highest sort of score over and over again across the uh, sample. So again, going back to this uh, slide previously, what we just hit on is the efficacy, meaning does it make you effective to know about this thing metacognitively? And the answer empirically is yes. It does. It makes you super effective. Um, now, what we're going to do is dive into the uh, other four studies that focused on this left side, which is: is it, does R exist universally in cognition in the mind and also in nature? Um, and so we're going to go into those to studies. We're going to highlight. We can't spend too much time on each one because they're, you know, they're pretty deep. Uh, in terms of, they would take a while to explain, so. Uh, yep, so this is just the uh, first question in our research was just a baseline to make sure that people, um, you know, could identify the the relational nature of these objects, meaning, you know, that, that when things are next to each other, how you distinguish them is different, the relational nature of distinction making. And so that was sort of a baseline for the next questions. Um, and this question was just showing that that people just you know people distinguish things um, not only on the things themselves but in relation to others. You see that with objects. You see that with people. Where you know at work you're the boss, and at home 
well, for me, I'm still the boss. <laughs> <laughs> at work, I'm just kidding. <laughs> at work, you're, you're the boss. At home, you know, you're That's the mom. So deluded. I know. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> the dogs are the bosses. <laughs> the dogs are the bosses. Um, but you know, you see, you see that the way that sorry, <laughs> resist. <laughs> well played. Um, you know, just that meaning making is relational in nature. That that objects sort of co-prime each other. And we're going to talk about that more in depth with the uh, the dog lab coat study. But then there's also this study where we just, uh, we're also trying to isolate the relational nature, like the physical relational nature of things and how we distinguish them. And the results of that are in the next slide. And this is a little bit more interesting. This is a fascinating study. And uh, without going too far into it, what, what happens is what you think would happen, right? The, the first thing is everybody thinks the left circle's left and everybody thinks the right circle's right. And everybody thinks that you know, the big circle's big and the small circle's small and the medium circle's medium. That that plays out the way you would think it would, which is, you know, not everybody, but most people uh, kind of understand those things relative to each other. Um, but what's, what's remarkable about this study and what you could spend, you know, a whole semester interacting with uh, is given in a graph in the paper, which looks like a very complex graph, but it's really not. It's It's simply saying that all this graph is saying is that they're not taking this, these three circles and all the different options as one fell swoop. There's not one perspective going on. There's not one set of relationships going on. There's at every, at every part of the X, Y grid, at every one of these boxes, they're setting up a new scenario with a new perspective and new relationships. So yeah. They're, they're making decisions incredibly dynamically based on co-priming, meaning that, that one action reaction priming, that one object is affecting the other object in very isolated moments of time. At each moment when the person is choosing, they're isolating that as a perspective and they're dynamically altering the relationships. That is absolutely remarkable. Uh, it shows how fast we're doing DSRP and how universally we're doing DSRP and how quickly it can change from literally one second to the next. Um, so in any case, I thought that was really interesting. If you look back at um, at this uh, data, there's there's one little piece of data here that's this... this uh, <laughs> 40.41 on the right there, center circle, large. Um, that to us was very strange. It, it's what you would call an anomaly in the data. And it and it was kind of like, what is going on? We tried everything. We crunched the data about a thousand different ways. Couldn't figure out what it was. Couldn't figure out what the person was, people were doing. 40% of people, almost half of the people did the same thing but we couldn't figure out what they did. Whereas everywhere else, they did exactly what we would expect. But we knew uh, what the reason. alternative hypothesis would predicted. And there had to be a reason. There had to be a reason. So, so we just wouldn't let it go. Uh, or I, maybe I wouldn't let it go. We never do. <laughs> uh, but it turns out that we finally figured it out. And the way we figured it out was um, we took a look at the actual, what the what the participant was viewing at the moment they did this. And it turns out that once again, they in that moment when they were judging that circle on that horizontal row, that circle was in the center of the screen. And so they were co-priming the screen to the circle and taking a, a different perspective just on that line item, just on where the far right line hits the second line of horizontal, they altered their perspective and their co-priming dynamic, their action reaction dynamic. And they and they said, oh, it's center, which when you see this, you go, oh yeah, it, it is center, <laughs> right? So pretty remarkable how sensitive, how sensitive DSRP co-priming or action reactioning is between concepts. Yes. Really 
Well, blew us away. It's funny because it seemed like an outlier and anomaly against what we were trying to prove, but actually, it actually proved it the reinforced point, the point, yeah. which was kind of cool, which is a nice thing. Exactly. Okay. This is the world famous dog lab coat study, also an opportunity to put an adorable puppy on a slide. You're, you're priming us with that picture of a puppy. I know. <laughs> I know, but I couldn't resist. He's dog so lab cute. coat. Yeah, that's a great point, Matt. I mean, like, what, what, what aren't we prime? We're what this study shows is that we're never not priming. Yeah, I mean that that's really and that's huge because priming is used in all research. Priming is used, and what this study is showing is that in many ways there's no such thing as non-priming. Mm -hmm. That we're always priming. That there's always a co-prime happening, um, and uh, and it's happening very dynamically and very quick. But the key is to be aware. If yes. Can. If you can, yeah, then you can do things to control for it. And but you can never ent entirely control for it. No. Um, just to, this study, again, we could spend a lot of time on this study, but we're essentially uh showing them different words and and then showing them those words together and seeing if the togetherness of the word affects the meaning of the original words. Yeah. So what what is essentially happening, if you can imagine is that in this case words, but it could be shapes, it could be objects, it could be things, it could be anything. Um, uh, but in this case, it's words and meanings that they're essentially vibrating. Think of it that way, that those words are like vibrating. The, co the conceptual meaning of those words in a person are vibrating. And when you put those two words and meanings into, a, into proximity with each other, they co-vibrate, they co-prime each other and therefore change their meaning. And then when you, when they're not, they, they don't have that effect. And that's the case for all things in the universe, but we wanted to see how sensitive it was in concepts and, and wording. So, so if you read this in the paper, there's a series of these tables and I wanna sort of give you the key to them. So if you go back to look at it, this is basically, the baseline. So it's it's how each person described each thing, dog, coat, and lab separately without a co-prime, right? And basically what you see is dogs are animals, coats are warm winter kind of coats is what most people describe. And lab had to do with like science, like laboratories. But then as you go through the paper, what you'll see here, for example, there's four of these. This is the effect of lab as a co-prime on the concept of coat. And what's highlighted in red are the ways that that concept or the meaning of that concept changed as a result of introducing the co-prime. Right? And another way of saying that is for most people, most of the time coat in the baseline was a warm wintry coat. Yes. But when it was with lab, it a substant a significant number of folks started thinking of it as something other than a warm wintry coat. Right. So lab had an effect on coat in terms of its meaning because we're under we're, what we're analyzing here is the underlying structure or meaning of the word lab or coat to participants. Right. And then you can just see and we just did it again and again and again. Dog on lab. You can see how it changed. So when you read the paper, if you weren't interested in this, and then the next. So one, lab goes from being a science lab to being more of a dog lab. Yep. Um, Same thing with um, coat as a co-prime of lab. Then it becomes strangely sort of lab coat and also Labrador. Yep. So you just what the point is that this is happening in your brain all the time. And um, this is dog on coat. and. This is happening all the time in your brain and people, very smart people like marketing people know that this is happening in your brain. So they'll put two things together and know that you're going to implicitly make a relationship and they're going to try to make that relationship something that will take your vote, your money, your time, whatever it is they're trying to get. And so co-priming is a really important concept that- And awareness of it, just like we talked yeah. about the efficacy, awareness of that makes you inoculated to all the things Laura just talked about, right? Like neuromarketing is just a field that's taking neuroscience and marketing and putting them together, ironically, in RDS. Um, and uh, it is ironic, isn't it? I and talk that. about our 
We have to, rem I don't remember. That. Right. So neuroscience is co-priming marketing and marketing is co-priming neuroscience. They create an RDS together. And, uh, and what is it? It's manipulating people's R's constantly, right? And their D's and their S's and P's also. But R's are, are really easy to manipulate. Why? Because when you put two things together close enough in the context, people. then people will make the relationship for the marketer. You, the marketer doesn't have to make the relationship for them. You just put them together, right? I put Osama bin Laden and Obama in the same picture and all of a sudden you start having thoughts like these two guys are somehow related right and you can win elections or at least affect elections by doing manipulations like that because people are going to make a relationship uh, because the mind's going to make a relationship because ours are universal or you could take an, a, a non-nutrient dense meal and put it next to the concepts of happy and toys and people think that's right you. <laughs> yeah, happy meal Same is thing. definitely not going to make you happy, but people believe believe it or Coke is life or you know friendship. Coke is friendship or whatever. Um, so I have a question I want to ask before you go on from there. So obviously there's sort of nefarious ways that you can use co-priming that you just talked about. Are there ways that you know we could use it, you know, say in a consulting project or working with our team that are helpful, you know, maybe to teach DSRP or to you know, work on a problem? Are there ways that you can sort of use this concept to um, get people to learn faster, get them to see something they hadn't seen before, you know, whatever the sort of benefit might be? Again, you know, not evil, <laughs> uh, yeah. minded, but sort of helpful. No, I mean, and and there's a ton of, there's a ton of really fantastic research out there. Uh, I'm in the process of collecting a, a number of it um, about placebo effects and priming effects. Uh, where, for example, you know, the difficulty of, of a task will be highly dependent on the perception of difficulty of a task will be highly dependent on whether the person feels that they have a choice in the task or not. Hmm. Right. So you can change, you know, in education, for example, if you're a student and you're feeling like a prisoner because you can't leave. Young students can't leave. I mean, I've always said like the difference between pedagogy and andragogy is simply that in pedagogy, they can't leave. In andragogy, they can <laughs> they can leave, right? So in, in other words, pedagogy doesn't have any feedback in it and andragogy does, mm -hmm. which is why, uh, you know, andragogy gets better over time and pedagogy doesn't typically. Um, pedagogy just being the education of kids, andragogy being the uh, education of adults. But if if... If a kid feels like they have forced to learn something and it's hard, that's going to have a co-priming effect, right? That mm -hmm. mental model is going to alter the way they engage in that task, mm -hmm. especially a difficult task like learning geometry or something like that, mm -hmm. right? And if they feel like they have a choice in the task, it's going to completely alter their uh, their their attitude and and the perceived difficulty of the task. So this stuff is playing out in so many different ways. And like you said, Matt, there are all these like, uh, I don't know what the word you used was, but uh, you know, nefarious yeah. kinds of uses, but for every nefarious use, there's a really positive use. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just being aware of RAR is, is gonna dynamically change the way you interact mm -hmm. out there. Well, and you can think about, you know, a lot of the thing is like with parenting, for example, a lot of it is changing the associations your kids are making with certain things from good to, you know, like, yeah, geometry is hard, sure, but it's not bad. It's just hard, you know, and mm -hmm. so then you associate hard with challenge, challenge with achievement. And it's like all of these things, you know, you know that those associations are powerful and bringing them to the surface, you know, half of the job is getting getting understanding of your That's kids' right. mental models about things and changing how they're perceiving them mm -hmm. to have a different mental model. And you so know, Linda just made a, a posted something that is really important along these lines. Uh, she said, I'm aware of false distinctions, but this is the first time I've considered false or manipulative relationships. Yeah. What's interesting about that idea is that, remember, distinctions, identity, other, are existential, which means when you make a distinction, you bring it into existence. Which means when you make a false distinction, at the very least, you've brought it into existence 
and therefore you acknowledge it. And if it's completely false, you might have a small chance of saying, wait a minute, is that right? Because it exists. But the beauty or the not beauty, the sort of terrible frightening part of R is that R's until you turn them into RDS's or RD's at least are hidden, which means we can use R's to super manipulate people because when they make the R, when they make the relationship, if I just put up two things, and a relationship is made based on the way that I put them up, then they're not always aware of it because just forming an R doesn't mean that you're bringing it into existence. Mm -hmm. It's often happening kind of like super subconsciously. And so R's are the way that we manipulate all the time. And if you look at some of the most manipulative kind of gaslighty things out there, it's like, huh, I wonder why blank and blank. I'm just asking, you know, and you're just like, you know, I'm just asking. We're just putting two things up in front of you. You figure it out yourself, right? And you're like, yeah, okay, you're not massively manipulating me, but it's manipulating the R's. So Scott asked a really good question that is related to something I was thinking as well. And you, you, and as you said, one of the most striking things about the research, I think, is that it's kind of constantly all relationships are changing every second around you, right? So if I'm the tallest person in a big room of people and a taller person walks in, everybody recalculates who the tallest person is, yep. what all the relationships are. So there's like a ton of work. Um, kind of going on all the time. Scott's question is, you know, is there research or what's your thought about whether people, when they start to sort of lock in on something, do they then pair away the others? Because the brain seems to be really good at, you know, kind of efficiency that way. And like vision, you know, vision sort of wipes out a whole bunch of stuff just to save processing power. Is, that, is a similar thing happening with relationships, either that you're aware of or even ones that you're not aware of? I, yeah, I definitely think that's true. As soon as you start distinguishing things, we are creating the, the increasing the probability of lock-in. Uh, the more things root, the more things can get locked in. And I think that the trick with, uh, we're doing a whole book right now on innovation, creativity, discovery, invention, all those kinds of synonyms or similarity, similarity functions. Um, and the trick is, once you've decided things like an R, for example, you can run with that, but you're always sort of like, you got one eye or one little set of neurons going, but are there different ones? Are there other ones? It doesn't have to be so much so that you derail your progress down a particular path or a particular direction, but it's always sort of keeping an eye out for the possibility that you're ending up going in the wrong direction or that you've that you're getting locked into the wrong direction. Well, and also for us, you know, we teach policy students at Cornell. And one of the things that we have to sort of untrain them to do is always start with looking for a linear causal relationship of things or taking somebody else's idea of what the relationship is between and among factors of a policy or a community or something that they're studying. So we're always like, let's just take a step back and let's just look at what I said at the beginning, like these webs of possible causes, cause versus correlate, like, and then challenge different types of possible relationships because we're so trained in A leads to B leads to C. Is to, like, we're so trained in that. And it's just, it totally limits the way we think about things. It limits our understanding of systems, all kinds of things, problems mm -hmm. down the road. Yep. It's a true story. Do you, I have a couple other questions, but do you have more slides you want to go through too? I don't we have to... one last slide, which is just the summary slide, which is in the paper. But you know, basically, what we were saying in the beginning that the relationship exists, knowing them increases your metacognition, your systems thinking. These. This is a summary yep. of the empirical things that you can take away from this this ecology of research and the. Mm -hmm. The first part, uh, the, the the red part is kind of the, uh, you know, emphasis, emphasis of, uh, of, the, of the statement, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> but I mean, I think that the, the one to highlight uh, 
which we have found and we just sort of alluded to at the beginning is that we often think that we're seeing, you know, we make a, a sort of diversity of relationships, but we also as, as a group see things similarly. There's that individual and collective le level that we should be paying attention to. And obviously that relationships are entirely entwined with the distinction systems perspectives piece as well, so. Mm -hmm. Those are, that's important for a bunch of different reasons. I just was in a, I was in the way north of Newfoundland and was having a, a debate with a few folks and, and it, they were essentially coming down on that side of like total relativism and solipsism and, and research like this shows that that's, it's just not possible, right? If, if everything was totally relative and if everything was totally solipsistic, meaning any anything goes, we all just are so different, we're thinking totally different things, then we wouldn't think the same things. You wouldn't see such a statistical pattern where we all tend to think the same things, but we also think a lot of different things, right? But within, we think those different things within sameness, right? So we think in statistical sameness, mm -hmm. and then inside of that sameness, there is diversity. But... Um, it's not. It's not just everything's relative and everybody's just thinking so differently. We we all experience a square, um, we all experience a circle, and then there is variation in some of the things we do, and that's critically important because otherwise we just end up in a very upside down world. Mm -hmm. Very good. So one one question I had, and again trying to relate this to you know working with our teams and our our project. So how do you go about teaching someone to build an RDS and to really understand the relationship? You know, all the time you see, you know, team A arrow to team B, you know, to, to project C and there's just arrows and no sort of thought. So how do you, you know, in, in a minute, how do you sort of tangibly get people to, to step away from that arrow and, and really understand what's going on? One thing that you say a lot is just make sure that that, that arrow has a stapler right? That there's an object, that that that, that arrow is, an, is a distinct thing and that it has parts, meaning there's money or resources or effort being put into what's in that relationship. And also that there's time being spent on maybe, maybe caretaking that that relationship exists, right? That, 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 that you're putting as much effort into, into the two things that are being related as you are into nurturing that that relationship exists and is concretized and has a function yeah. And resources and effort behind it. Yeah. Yeah. And the way, the, the, I guess the thing I would say is, and, and this is not something I would have said 20 years ago. And I, I keep saying that to folks, like this is something that we learned and it's so basic and it's so obvious, but it took us 20 years to learn it. And I, and I don't know why it took us 20 years. It makes me feel really dumb <laughs> that it took 20 years to learn this, but it did, which is you've got to get people practicing like mm -hmm. I, I i i've i've said this a lot because you know my son right now is in jujitsu and it's like they do moves and they practice moves and jujitsu is a very dynamical thing it's it's very dynamical and so there's no way to sort of learn jujitsu jujitsu is like an emergent property and i would say the same thing about systems thinking there's no way to really quote unquote learn systems thinking it's an emergent property of doing a bunch of things that are learnable and so how, how do you get people good at systems thinking? You get them practicing. They can't, we can't just say RDS. Mm -hmm. We've got to get them to build 200 RDSs. Yeah. And, and if they build 200 RDSs, they'll suddenly be doing RDSs all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Yeah, that's a, that's a great... Um... <laughs> Martial arts, I, I use all the time. I mean, it's because you can do the simple thing on day one, but 20 years from now, you're doing the same thing, but it's nothing like it. And it's yeah. uh, it really is very similar in terms of learning sort of these subtle skills. Um, very good. Well, as promised, it's a um, quarter after the hour right now. So if you need to, to take off, that's wonderful. I want to thank uh, Derek and Laura for walking us through this and there's there's certainly a lot more to, to talk about so we'll we'll continue on here for about 15 minutes but I just want to uh, set anybody out who needs to uh, head back to the rest of your day so uh, thank you for joining looks like Todd's gonna take off thank you good to see you all
Great seeing you all. You. It's been a while. Yeah. Appreciate you coming. Yeah. And Scott yeah. as well. Uh, so yeah, so um, please, if you have questions, uh, you can uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, there we go. Scott has has one, and want to hear uh, you know from everybody as we as we go. So what do you got, Scott? Um, I I think this idea that most of the relationships in the universe are hidden is something I've been dancing around, and and thank you for putting it so succinctly. I think I've even heard it before, but I just hadn't remembered. And the context is with my elderly mom, who is not seeing the relationships between her technology and the rest of the world, because it's all hidden. You know, it's just a little technical device. And, you know, even if you even if you pick up a landline phone and there's a cable, you don't understand the whole tele telecommunications network, but it doesn't matter. You see the little cable, it goes into the wall. And you know that on the other end, there's another person with a phone with a cable that goes into the wall. And okay, there, I've got my little relationship and I understand what that is. And what I'm what I'm noticing is that mapping automatically does that because now you see the two little things and then there's, oh wait, is should there be a line between them or not? Oh, and so I'm I'm wondering if the mapping language, which is so easy to understand could be explained in the same way that you explain what an R is, and now you have RAR, now you have cognitive complexity instantly that you've increased it. And I, I just wonder if it's easy enough to explain the mapping side of it to, to help do that, kind of extend it. That, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, go ahead. You can go ahead. And I can do it on him after that. I, th I think it's, um... I think the mapping is a, is a fantastic way, whether you're mapping in a software, or whether you're just doing it like with pencil and paper, or, you know, with your finger on fog or whatever it is. <laughs> um, it, it, it is it is it is fantastic because it elementalizes everything, right? It makes everything kind of. Um, sorry, my watch is going crazy. Uh, I should have turned it off. I don't actually know how to turn it off. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, if, if you, you know, it, it tactilizes everything. And, and that's the part that is so hard about relationships. It's so often relationships are invisible, right? If I take a family photo, I can pick out all the identities. I can even see the group. I can see the part whole system, but I can't see the relationships in the family photo. If I look through a microscope, I can see the structure. I can see the, the the vacuoles, I can see the different parts of a cell, but I can't see the relationships, you know? And so relations, nature has a, a remarkable way of hiding relationships. And the the efficacy clause, as it were, of, of this research is if you just know that RAR is happening, then you can make structural predictions about RAR exactly. and you can know you can bring them out of the hidden zone and into the seed scene zone. But that's why mapping is so good because mapping is forcing you to visually structure your thinking, yeah. which reminds you that there's predictive structures that you could ask yourself at any two cards, any four cards, how are they connected? If they're connected, if so, how? And then you can just go through in your own mind, like, you know, you, you have a series of questions you can structurally ask about that map. And that's why I think, you know, we see that, you know, in our class, ever since we've had the uh, software as a tool and anything that we do, executive education, Cornell education, people, you know, the fact that they can see it reminds them to ask those questions about the structures and, and know that there's the potential for all four things. And that's literally moment. literally what Linda just wrote in the chat there is a fantastic point. Like in mapping, we draw an R arrow and then stop thinking about it. But D, S, and P are required for R to exist. That means a further analysis of R. Yeah, and that's absolutely exactly. right. If yeah. you stop, if you let a, a student or anybody sort of stop at making just the relationship, that's great. They they did something most people aren't going to do. They made a relationship. But if you don't go into that and realize, oh, you can distinguish it, you can systematize it, you can relate the part, you can part party the systematized relationship that you just made, then 
then you're kind of leaving a lot on the table, right? You're, yeah. you're, there's, a, there's a lot more on the table that you could take. Speaking of the table, it's also right, Linda, about the blocks. The blocks do the same thing. You know, they force you to be structural. They make you think about additional structures. The manipulation of them on the table sort of tells you, guides the thinking. And R and P, R and R especially, but also P, there they tend to be much more unseen than D and S. Yeah. Other than D, D O, obviously, is unseen also. But. We can't talk about those things. This is the R session. I know. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> please don't. Please don't. Um, are you, one thing is again similar to perspectives. You know, there's there's we think of relationships often as human. You know, my, with my work partner or whatever. Um, but can you talk about some non-human perspectives that either are sorry relationship now I forget relationships that um, you think are you know interesting or fun or or useful you know that are not uh, things that we would normally think about non-human non-human re relationships uh, meaning like not at the sociological level yeah like you know a bike tire to a road or you know there's, yeah there's I mean, lots of sort of stuff like so what's, many what's, cool there's so many cool relationships out there they're they're literally everywhere i mean one of the things that i do that i love doing my mind loves doing it is just looking around the room and looking at whatever object catches my eye and then looking at the the relationships that are that are physically a part of that object, whether it's like, you know, the sewing that's on this part of my jacket or whether it's the way that this pin, you know, this whole clasp is a relationship, you know, forming between the jacket and, and allows the pin to stay there or whether or whether it's a, t a tongue and groove joint of a chair. Uh, and I just always am looking at or or the the screw top between the bottle and the and the and the top you know that's a relationship and somebody had to design those relationships right those are really interesting things and i see them everywhere i go you know how does a how does a picture frame hang on a wall you know mm -hmm. how does that happen and what are all the millions of ways you can hang a picture frame on a wall mm -hmm. right i mean it, it there's just so many cool ways that you can hang a picture frame on a wall all of those are relationships. And so I'm always just going through, um, and I love designing, for example, uh, clothing and, and uh, in particular, like climbing clothing, you know, or sleeping bags or backpacks. And, you know, half the battle in sleeping bags and backpacks and, and that, that kind of technical gear is the sewing because the seams are where things are weak. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Right. If I pull on a jacket, where is it going to rip? It's going to rip in the seams. If a if a ja if a jacket's supposed to be uh, waterproof, where is it going to leak in the seams? Mm -hmm. You know, it's so if you can make a jacket that has no seams, then you have less <laughs> probability of leakage. You have less probability of uh, tearage. You have all you know. That's to me, that's like amazing. You know what mm -hmm. you can do with with thinking about relationships just in material things all around us. Huh. Yeah, and all the ones you just said, I mean, there's also the, the weather, right? The, the weather, whether it's hot or cold or rainy and the, you know, the person, uh, you know, where all the different uh, characteristics. Is, is I love, I love, Matt, that you just said weather because I, it, it has always been the case and it was the case for me. When I took my first course in climatology, I really understood the dynamicism of relationality because weather fundamentally is this like completely relational thing. And mm -hmm. if you learn about high pressures and low pressures and, and how that, how that alters, how that creates wind and weather and all that kind of stuff just comes from the interrelationality, relative relationality of high and low pressures, mm -hmm. then you get, you know, you get all the things that, that we experience on a, on a daily basis, heat and cold and wind and, you know, jet streams and, uh, you know, morning dew and all these different things. Uh, if you want to animate there, just talk about weather. <laughs> I, love yeah, I, I love weather. <laughs> weather is one of the best things to study to mm -hmm. deeply understand our my, my first magazine when I was about seven was Weatherwise. So I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> I love weather. Weather is amazing. So uh, I Linda, I'd love to hear 
if you're willing to share a little bit about your uh, fun uh, deep analysis that you talked about, yeah, you, you want to share a little bit about what you did? The which? I don't know. I didn't hear the first part. Linda just posted that she did oh, an analysis oh, of so, uh, parts of speech. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, Linda, share that. Um, it would, it would, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, it would take a lengthy discussion, but I went through and nouns are about distinctions. Adjectives are about relationships. Conjunctions are about relationships. Um, interjections are about perspectives and not just those things. They're also all the D and S and RMP is I think Laura, you said it best one time, you said it's the underneath thinking, mm -hmm. but without it, we don't write. We don't, we can't write without taking the parts, the words and putting them together into the holes, the sentences and taking the sentence parts and putting them into the paragraphs. But it's, it's even deeper than that. It's distinctions and, and verbs are amazing because there's three different kinds. And one is a, one is a linking verb and one is a, action verb and one is a helping verb so it's pretty fascinating to to think about dsrp and how we use it every single time that we write something yeah. i love that yeah cool. so. thank you that's that's wonderful um it, I, it's it's interesting how uh, you know a lot of what we're talking about like you said you did that for fun you know Derek, you're talking about weather and you know it's, it's fun to apply these ideas i think there's a lot of sense of folks that this is just for work or whatever but you can yeah. you can really uh dig into some pretty interesting things that are just interesting um yeah. with the last couple of minutes i'd love oh. On R and kind of what you uh, you know anything we can help with as your as uh, fans of the SRP and what you guys are thinking about in the lab um, next. Our next. What are we doing next? To oh, just, sorry, you broke out a little bit, Matt. I didn't future hear the research on R. Future research. Yeah. On R. Thinking about. I think actually. Oh, yeah. Thinking of our shortcomings. If I were to admit we have any shortcomings, really, but <laughs> one of our shortcomings is. Um, translating this empirical research into case studies and real world examples of application. You know, it's, it's hard to build the bridge from the empirical stuff to when we're standing in the room with executives and we're talking to them about silos and we're saying, well, the, the, direct, the direct solution to silos is something called an RDS, right? An RDS is important because of blah, 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 and back it into the research. Like there's some lack of uh, congruency or consistency. Like I feel like they still feel a little disjointed, the empirical stuff and the real world case. So I think we should write some case examples, yeah, but ground cool. them in sort of the, the real sort of underlying dynamics. To me, that would be a goal to do that. Like just Linda's example, right? Yeah. Just like something like that, where you could really write it up and say, like, this is why the dynamic understand the dynamics of this matters, right? Like, I, I just wrote a blog the other day that that might be of interest uh, to folks. Um, I my forget daily what it's called. Uh, oh, it's going to be her daily rep today, so uh, you'll see it. But it, I, it was called something like "Just say don't." I don't understand yet. Yeah. Um, and it and it really has to do with the idea that. Um, People don't utilize the word theory and things like that quite correctly in the public domain. And I, I think a huge part of that is understanding the difference between abstraction and pattern recognition and, um, and instantiations. We mostly focus on the instantiations. And if we don't look at the pattern, and pattern is all about relationships, right? Yeah. If we don't look at the pattern of the instantiations, it's going to be very difficult to really deeply understand anything, frankly. Um, and, and yet we're sort of training people to look only at the instantiations. We look at the events, we look yeah. at what happened, but we don't look at that it's happened 10 times now, right? So we're constantly like, why am I so unhappy? Or why, why does this, my relationships not work? And you're like, but you're just repeating the same thing, but you're not even seeing that you're repeating it, right? And so if people can't see patterns, if all they see is I, I broke up and then I broke up and then I broke up and then I broke up and they don't see a pattern across that, which is the relationships, then then um, we're in trouble. 
you know, like that, that's, you have to, and the science is basically the fundamentally at its core about recognizing patterns and patterns is about relationships. Um, and you can predict. So I'd, I'd like to, I, I'm interested, I mean, to get back to your question, Matt, I'm interested in, in trying to help people understand why abstraction is something you should work at understanding. Mm. That's a much better right? That's because, better. because I know that it might feel abstract, but because it's abstract, it's useful. And Kurt Lewin said, there's nothing more practical than a good theory. And he meant is literally a good theory is the most practical thing that you could ever have. And people mistake practical with those, with the recognition of instantiation, but practical, the most practical thing is the recognition of pattern, which is abstract by definition. And, and so I think the hardest part if we're going to get to truly eight now 8 billion thinkers, oh, yeah. the hardest part is getting people to be willing to climb the learning curve of, of abstraction. Because as soon as abstraction happens, they go, this is dumb. It's too theoretical. It's too philosophical. It's too this. And you're like, if you just replace that with, I don't understand it yet. I don't understand it yet, which is a much less hubristic thing to say and a much more beneficial personally thing to say, then then you will have the world open up to you. See, but that's... That seems very related too, just to people's general discomfort with uncertainty and how important uncertainty is. It's the same thing, right? You don't know, but you have you have your theory. I guess it's directly related. You have your theory of what's coming, but people's kind of shut down if something feels uncertain. Uh, seems interestingly related. Well, yeah, especially given the fact that uncertainty is like, you know everything the fabric <laughs> of the universe right so it's like we what we should do is just get good at uncertainty right right and and change and challenge go together so if we challenge ourselves with abstraction or we challenge ourselves with um uncertainty the great thing about the mind and the body is it will adapt to whatever challenge we throw at it um but a lot of times we just kind of give up and we have all these excuses for why we give up, like it's to this or it's to that. And I think um, if we challenge ourselves, so I'd, I'd like to study more things like that. Yeah. Very cool. Well, um, Scott, I see you have a hand. I, I want to be sensitive at the time though, since we're over, are you? Uh, okay, very good. So uh, with that, I just want to, that's a pretty deep way to end, give us all something to uh, to think about until the next session. So I want to thank uh, Derek and Laura for spending time uh, an hour this morning and uh, with a good ranging uh, conversation. We um, will post this video uh, next week. And also, please put on your calendar distinctions is our next one after the holiday. So it'll be January 5th. Uh, we'll have a similar discussion on distinctions. And uh, then we're, we're sort of starting to plan what uh, similar events will be next year. So interested in things that uh, you'd like to hear about, maybe things you'd like to present, um, and just trying to sort of continue on these, these uh, informal discussions. I think it's a great way to learn, and especially, I mean, everybody on this call has been doing this for quite a while already, but I mean, I find I learn something new every time, and I uh, hope you all are as well. So, and, and again, just getting to that, uh, maybe we're all green belts now uh, <laughs> as, as we're moving our way along. So, uh, with that, thank you all, and uh, we'll see you in Systems Thinking Daily. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good to Thanks, see you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. See ya. Take care.